A man walked alone. He walked among the ancient woods of a primordial lake. He thought of ancient things, dangerous things. He wondered then what secrets the universe still held. Little did this man know he was about to find out what those secrets were, and it would change his life and the course of human history forever. Friedrich Nietzsche is known to most as the philosopher of the Overman, or the Ubermensch, trying to usher in this generation of people who break from Christian morality and traditional Western values to boldly create their own, and thereby create a new world. But this picture is a pale image of his true vision, a shallow pond masquerading as a boundless sea. Nietzsche's work is poetic and passionate. It dives into the depths of ancient languages and mythologies, and even anticipates many of the discoveries of modern physics and psychology. At the center of these insights is the day Nietzsche experienced his most profound revelation, his discovery of the eternal return. In this video, we explore the day Nietzsche solved the universe. But before we dive in, I would like to ask for your support on this channel. It's hard to get momentum going on this platform, and it just keeps getting harder the longer we go without seeing a real breakout. So if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you share your thoughts in the comments, it helps us learn more about the types of videos you would like to see. We also have a YouTube channel members section with some members only videos if you're interested in that. Before we talk about that fateful day, we need to know how Nietzsche ended up at that lake in the first place. Despite later writing books like The Antichrist and Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche began his life as a devout Lutheran. His father was a pastor and young Nietzsche was bound for this profession as well, especially after his father died at a very young age. This meant he would receive an excellent education in classic literature, languages like Greek and Latin, and much more. After his discovery of ancient poetry and mythologies, especially the tragic playwrights and poets of ancient Greece, Nietzsche became less interested in Christianity, as he felt there was still much to interpret and discover about the meaning of the universe. His discovery of Arthur Schopenhauer, especially his magnum opus, The World as Will and Representation, proved to be the final straw, and Nietzsche fully turned away from the religion of his father. Nietzsche was something of a prodigy in his early days as a philologist. The first paper he wrote in graduate school was published in the number one academic journal in Germany. And when he began what today would be considered a PhD, his academic committee simply told him to skip it and go on to become a professor at the University of Basel. He became full professor at the age of just 25. He even became friends with the famous German composer, Richard Wagner. That said, this period of happiness and success didn't last for Nietzsche. He felt that academia had become stale and unable to break from its dogmatic ways. During this early period, he wrote his first major work, The Birth of Tragedy. But this work was vastly misunderstood and even caused Nietzsche to be the butt of a joke among many of his peers. In this work, Nietzsche tried to convey two main elements of life found in the ancient Greeks that he felt was missing from the Europe that he lived in, that is, Victorian-era Europe. These were the Apollonian and the Dionysian. The Apollonian is that part of us that strives to grow, to achieve, to immortalize ourselves in our work, legacy, and families. It's that natality in us, right, the energy that wants to live life. The Dionysian is the despair, the mania, but even the excitement and the impulsivity induced in us when the world and life takes these important things away from us. For Nietzsche, Europe had tried to make itself all Apollo and no Dionysus. In other words, in trying to come up with the perfect morality, in trying to make everything purely logical and make life follow perfectly guided rules, he felt that there was this entire half of life that cannot be ignored, but was being ignored by Europe, and that this was causing them all kinds of problems. For Nietzsche, the Dionysian is essential 
for humbling our egos and providing us with new beginnings. And because Europe was no longer in touch with this side of itself, he did not feel it could create new art, new ideas, or new culture. Now, of course, as you can imagine, these ideas did not go over well with academia. Nietzsche eventually had enough, and this, combined with his poor health, forced him to resign his post. He retreated into solitude, traveling the mountains of the Alps, the shores of the Mediterranean, and the cities of Italy in search of the meaning and secrets of life. While most philosophers of history felt they should become minimalist and lock themselves in a room to be alone with purely rational thoughts, Nietzsche felt that the answers had to be found out there in the world, among the actual experiences of life. As he grappled with the hypocritical moralities of Europe and critiqued Western thought up and down, he realized that in order to really find a new way to follow his own advice, he had to become something else. It was amongst the New Year winds in the city of Genoa, when the spirit of January filled his heart, that he set forth his Amor Fati, which means love of fate. He wrote, I will be one of those who makes things beautiful. Amor Fati, let that be my love from now on. I do not want to wage war against ugliness. I do not want to accuse. I do not even want to accuse the accusers. Let looking away be my only negation. And all in all and on the whole, someday I want only to be a yes-sayer. Even with this new commitment, there was still a problem. How does one deal with the tragedy of life? How can you be a yes-sayer when the world and the people in it do terrible things? When society fails to reward you for good living and seems to reward those who only pretend to be good? How do you explain suffering and unfairness, let alone learn to love it, with a personal commitment to Amr Fati? It wasn't enough. There had to be something that made Amr Fati the right choice. Something cosmic and universal that made it true that this is the best way to live life. But what could that possibly be? We have now arrived at that fateful day in 1881. Nietzsche walked alone as he always did, thinking, feeling, trying to forget in order to rediscover the universe for himself. As he wandered the woods of Lake Silvaplana near the village of Surlay, Switzerland, he came across something that made him stop. A pyramidal, monolithic rock, something otherworldly looking, was straight ahead. As he approached, he was suddenly invaded by a terrible thought, so terrible that it may just be exactly what he was looking for. He jotted down this revelation on a small piece of paper with the title, 6,000 Feet Beyond Man in Time. What he described as the greatest formula for affirming life came in the form of the principle of eternal return and the character of Zarathustra. The eternal return is a complex and controversial idea, with many believing Nietzsche set this forth as a simple thought experiment meant to prompt us to change our lives, as its first appearance is a demon coming in the night to inform you that you have to relive every choice you have ever made over and over again. But this appears in the passage of the gay science just before Zarathustra wakes up from his dream, meaning that this version is simply what prompts Zarathustra into action. While thinking eternal return is a big part of it, it's important to see that Nietzsche believed that this was a cosmic principle. In brief, the eternal return is the problem that things like religion and ideologies have been trying to solve since the dawn of time. But Nietzsche, instead of coming up with some strict identity that fixes us in eternity or with the gods, wanted to stare the harsh realities of eternal recurrence in the face. For Nietzsche, the chaotic forces of nature had already shown that they cared little for human needs and wants. But that didn't mean that human needs and wants couldn't get in touch with that chaotic force and weren't tied to it in some cosmic sense. The difficulty of the eternal return is it means that all things come to an end. But it also means that the universe provides new beginnings. But we can't really access these new beginnings unless we accept it. This type of knowledge is something Nietzsche always referenced as nitimur in vetitum, the forbidden knowledge that religions and ideologies through history did not want people to know. 
in proposing eternal return as not just the problem but the solution Nietzsche wants us to f to actually think it and just like the thought experiment where the demon comes to you in the night and tells you you have to relive all of your decisions this prompts us to take our lives seriously to not place our hopes in the eternal or in the identity we have secured in some ideology what this means is that thinking eternal return gives you access to the phenomenon of life not just your life right in thinking it your experience of time goes from having to endure your role in this world sequentially and terribly until maybe you can retire or maybe you die and go to heaven to this continuous return of opportunities to live life joyfully i know that all might have sounded a little complicated or out there but it's a concept that nietzsche himself wrote an entire book thus spoke zarathustra just to get the ball rolling on communicating i wanted to emphasize this aspect of nietzsche because in a lot of places online i have seen so many surface level versions of nietzsche set forth Versions that run the risk of making his work seem like it is something that it isn't. The Ubermensch and the Overman are representations of you living a life that you didn't think was possible. They appear at a moment. There's no such thing in Nietzsche's work as an Overman who actually lives. It's always futural. It's always a possibility for you. If you're interested in learning more about Nietzsche, check out some of the other videos we have done and drop a comment below with your thoughts and any recommendations of what you'd like to hear about next. Also, don't forget to check out our members only section where we have additional videos and recordings. I'll leave you off with one final quote to help you think about this more nuanced version of Nietzsche. A Nietzsche far more concerned with love and vitality than something like masculinity and dominance. This is a fragment from the Will to Power collection. Nietzsche wrote, A full and powerful soul not only copes with painful, even terrible losses, deprivations, robberies, insults, it emerges from such hells with a greater fullness and powerfulness, and, most essential of all, with a new increase in the blissfulness of love. I believe that he who has divined something of the most basic conditions for this growth in love will understand what Dante meant when he wrote over the gate of his inferno, I too was created by eternal love.